if you didn't take out Young and other kids there on privilege You should be so different Now I don't really mind anything to feel fine Tired of just existing We're living in life the next best thing with my dress and letter is that be on a leather oh 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 dress and letter with that be on a leather oh oh everybody and welcome to our weekly board session. It's Wednesday, September 27th, 2023. It's 9 o'clock. We're here in the center hearing room, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. As always, we start with the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you would please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and um, I have some letters or some emails to enter into the record for public comment. We got an email from Jennifer Gunter and an email from Christina Milkarek, uh, both regarding election machines. And so those emails have been uh, entered into the public record. Um, and then do we have anybody else signed up for public comment? Great. So once you've signed up, if you want to just come over here and introduce yourself for the record and, and give us your comments. I'm trying hard to fill this out right now with my left hand. Oh, okay. So it's taking you a little longer. Do you want to come over to this desk right here? Yes. Yep. And then just pull that microphone close to you. Introduce yourself. Oh, right now. Right now. Yeah, it's public comment it's time. It's public comment time. You made it. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Pamela Lyons Nelson. I'm a resident of Salem and have been for 46 years. Um, the comment, what I want to talk about this morning is an incident that happened in my neighborhood which affects you directly. Um, and that is that uh, on October 1st, I was getting ready for the, for the next door neighbor event, the annual next door neighbor event helping a neighbor, and I was attacked by her dog. This has resulted in the loss of the use of my right hand for two months now, as of what, tomorrow? Two months tomorrow. It's resulted in surgery to repair the two tendons that were severed. <clears throat> I'll never have full use of my right hand again in the way that I have been using it. And <laughs> it takes me forever to do something like fill out a form. This dog, this was the sixth time that this dog has bitten someone. Mm -hmm. I reported it because I was in the emergency room. My other two neighbors, and these are only the people that live in the neighborhood that we know of. Um, <clears throat> the first one, the dog was given 14 days probation. I looked at the man's scars here. It was hard enough that he bit through his jacket. I don't know why he was only given 14 days probation instead of following the one bite provision. If he had been uh, put down or another measure taken, perhaps I wouldn't have lost the use of my right hand for as long as I ever will have lost the use of it. I will have it back but not in the way that I'm used to having a right hand. Um, the second one was a next door neighbor to the dog. The third one was a next door uh, one off neighbor from the dog. The third one was a landscape man maintenance person who of course is not going to report this. He'll lose his job, he thinks. The fourth one was the neighbor on the other side of the dog 
And the fifth one was this past summer when the dog jumped over its tender to attack a woman who I believe is 86 years old. This is unconscionable. If dog control had been on the job, I would never have been bitten. The little old lady would not have ended up with all these, this damage to her. I am extremely unhappy with this. And I decided to come today because it's your job. You three have the job of protecting us from dangerous dogs. This dog attacked with no signal whatsoever. I've been raising and training dogs with my family since I was eight. <clears throat> Boxers, Pekingese, mostly. I had to know what a dog who is going to attack looks like. And I do, except for this dog. No raised tackles, no barking, no growling, no ears laid back, no tail in an aggressive position, no nothing. It came out from behind a bush and lunged while I had my hand on the gate to the backyard. The owner was right behind it, called the dog off, took me to the hospital, said, we'll pay all your bills, et cetera, et cetera. They're moving out of the neighborhood. The neighborhood seems to have information. I don't, because I'm not exactly in that area. I'm a block up. Um, that these people are thinking of bringing their dog back. They returned the dog to the breeder to avoid it being put down. I don't know what they did the other times the dog bit, but I know that that is no way to handle a dangerous dog with a repeated pattern of biting enough to require medical attention. It's been two months. I've had no contact from dog control at all. No contact. No one has tried to contact me. I want something done. I want the dog put down because it's dangerous. It's not vicious. This is not a vicious dog. It's a dangerous dog. The difference to me that I've always had, well, I don't know what, with, what, what opinion I might have had before I was eight or nine, but let's say always as an adult, is that the difference between a dangerous dog and a vicious dog is a vicious dog will give you a lot of signals, will try to scare you off first. And because it's generally fear motivated so many times, you have plenty of time to at least regroup yourself. I did not know I was being bitten until its teeth were in my hand. And that's because this neighbor had two of these dogs. This dog's a Bouvier. Its uh, show height, this dog exceeded the show height, was 27 inches at the shoulder. Most of these desks are 30 inches. So this dog is up here. Its face is up here at table height. They had two of these. One was a show dog dropout, who was a love, described, and I had met this dog once, and I agree with this, as a lab in poodle clothing. It's, the breed is called a Bouvier. It's a cowherd. It is bred to, to rear up and knock against a cow with its body weight and turn it, because cows don't care where they're going, generally. I mean, if you want them to move someplace else, and you haven't been screaming and yelling at them, they'll probably just move there if you push them that direction. And that's what Bouviers do. They do not bite. But this one has bitten since it was a puppy. This woman has done everything her trainer said. I know the trainer. I respect the trainer. The trainer, as we were sitting in the ER, waiting to be served, and this was Silverton ER, so we didn't wait very long. Um, the, the trainer said, you have done everything you could. 
You have done everything you could. You could double every measure you've taken and it wouldn't make any difference. You cannot train this dog out of biting. And so they sent it back to the breeder. Thank you, Palin, for coming. I, I want you to know normally we limit public testimony to two minutes. Um, I didn't in this case because I think this is really important, you coming here and telling us about this. We obviously didn't know about this incident, and you're right, we are responsible for dog control here. And sometimes people will say to us, um, you know, you should have a no-kill policy. Basically, you should never put dogs down. And I think um, you've articulated well why, realistically, sometimes in order to keep our community safe, we have to put dogs down. That's just a reality that we deal with. We'll look into this situation. Like I said, we weren't aware of it, and this is exactly what public comment is for, is, is for you to come and tell us things that, that we need to look into and that we're not aware of. I do have to move us on, so um, I want to thank you for your time and for being here today. Thank you. Please remember, this was the sixth bite. Yeah. The sixth. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Please. Chair, would you mind if Matt uh, was to walk her upstairs to community services and, and have good. a conversation? Just, you know, create a record. Uh, the director of community services oversees the dog shelter and they're upstairs. Uh, so Matt Lawyer, who's sitting in the audience, will take you upstairs so you can have a conversation with Chris Epley if he's in or Kelly Weiss if she's in. Remember, I haven't been contacted yet after I understand, months. so they'll okay. help you upstairs. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pamela, sure appreciate it. And thank you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you for being here. Swift recovery. It'll be a year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, I see that you are there I'm here for ready, re <laughs> ready to publicly <laughs> testify for the flu vaccine. So why don't you <laughs> come and, and uh, if uh, the team from the health department wants to come as well, it would be great. Well, they want you to sit for sure. Oh, in case you pass over. out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We do have a paramedic in the audience. This is only He's like my <laughs> chief man is like where? It's only, yeah. it's only like my ninth year of doing this. I haven't fainted yet. Okay. Here's the first time for everything. So this is the first time we've done uh, one presenter and one vaccinator, so I guess I will start talking. Please, um, yeah. My name is Rachel Posnick. I'm one of the epidemiologists at the Marion County um, Health and Human Services, and I'm just gonna give some general information about flu vaccines while our nurse Great. gets ready. Um, so just in general, for those who may not know, um, the flu or influenza is a respiratory virus um, and it's typically spread person to person through respiratory droplets. There are two main types of influenza that make humans sick. Those are types A and B. Um, and it causes mild to severe illness um, that can lead to hospitalization and death in severe cases. Um, symptoms can include uh, fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose, congestion, muscle or body aches, headaches, tiredness, vomiting and diarrhea, um, the gastrointestinal symptoms are more common in children than they are in adults. Um, after exposure uh, to the influenza virus, it takes about two days for somebody to develop symptoms, and then they're most infectious for about three to four days after their symptoms start. Um, people at risk for more severe illness are um, individuals that are over the age of 65, children under the age of five, um, people who are pregnant, and then people with medical um, conditions like asthma, diabetes, um, and heart disease. So to get an actual flu diagnosis, you would need to be tested by your doctor or at urgent care or an emergency department. There are antivirals that can be used to treat influenza. Um, and these are typically recommended for individuals who are hospitalized um, or those at higher risk for severe illness. Uh, current estimates put disease burden in the United States population between three and 11% um, each year, depending on the severity of the flu season, which of course we don't know until it gets here. Um, based on the 2022 census data, that's about 10 to 40,000 Marion County residents each year, just so we can get an idea of disease burden. 
the best and most important first step to preventing influenza is the flu vaccine, which is why we're here today. Um, it reduces risk of illness, especially serious complications associated with influenza, um, like hospitalization and death. Um, and also, I think just to keep in mind the burden on our hospital system. Um, it's also important to avoid others that are ill, cover your coughs and sneezes, and wash your hands with soap and water. So all the things that we've been saying forever. Um, so this flu vaccine um, that Commissioner Cameron will receive today um, is updated based on flu activity that we're seeing in the Southern Hemisphere as they go through their flu season before we do. Um, and then this year's vaccine is a quadrivalent uh, vaccine that protects against two strains of flu. So it's two strains of A, or four strains of flu, two strains of A and two strains of B. Um, and then for adults ages 65 and older, um, it's recommended that they receive the higher dose vaccination. Um, and I know I hear this all the time, so I'm just gonna review it again. It is not possible to get the flu from the flu vaccine. It's not biologically possible. Um, the flu vaccine is estimated to prevent 40 to 60% of flu illness, um, depending on how well the um, flu is developed based on what we're seeing in the flu vaccine is developed based on what we're seeing in the Southern Hemisphere and how well it matches. Um, it's also determined by who gets vaccinated. Um, and it takes about 14 days to reach uh, maximum effectiveness. So if you're exposed before that window, you wouldn't have as much protection as you would, um, which is why it's important to get it early before the flu season really ramps up. Um, and then to get your flu vaccine, you can call your doctor's office, um, come to Marion County Health and Human Services, or most pharmacies will also carry the vaccine. I think that's it. Unless there's questions, I will let Debbie get the vaccine. I want to see Commissioner Cameron's courage today. Mr. Chair, um, if I may, I'm not getting the 65 and older one today. <laughs> it's the young person. <laughs> well, I just want to tell you, Commissioner Cameron, I'm, uh, I'm getting old. Well, you're I'm, a little ways from the I'm getting old. I'll, I'll tell you later. I, I don't want to take the attention away from, from the excitement. <laughs> there. Is she done? That's how easy it is. Distract. Oh, afterwards? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Encouraging. I just want to encourage people to get their flu vaccine. So that's why I do this every year. We yeah. do really appreciate yeah. it. We look forward to it. Thank well, you so much. And, and uh, Commissioner Cameron, the reason why I'm getting old is because I used to, like when I was young and, and, and invincible, I was like, I, I don't need the flu vaccine. I'll just, get the, I'll just get the flu. Who cares? I don't care. Now I have a bunch of kids at home. And I get somewhere between four to six illnesses every winter, as a matter of course. Like, if I can get one less, like, I'm on that. I'm like, one, one fewer sickness, that's, that's what I'm doing. So now, now I get the flu shot. Funny how that works. That's so funny. I just encourage you to wash your hands. I do that, too. And then I do that you should too. be fine. I do that, too. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, we have, oh, we have a consent agenda up next. But, I'd be but, happy to read it. Do you want do you want to wait yeah, for Commissioner Cameron? Oh, sure. All right, we will, we will go into recess here until Commissioner Cameron returns. Consent agenda under Board of Commissioners OLCC application. 
uh, let's see, recommend denial of the 104 LLC DBA L Tamarindo Restaurant Sports Bar Live Music uh, OLCC application. Um, and approve amendment number eight to renew the contract for services with the Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency and add $318,000 for a new contract total of $1,852,559 to provide services to veterans in Marion County through June 30th, 2024. And under Public Works approve a resolution authorizing Marion County Parks to apply for a county opportunity grant from the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department for planning at Salmon Falls Park. All right, I will second the motion. We have a motion a second. Is there further discussion? Mr. Yes. Oh, yes, we got lots of discussion, please. <laughs> I know, not normal. I just want to say for the record that the OLCC application is formerly the name under the name Remy's, which we actively pursued denial of application to the OLCC uh, earlier this spring for repeated uh, calls and burden on the public safety system for uh, very, very bad behavior over on Lancaster Drive. And this is basically the exact same application under a new name, uh, which is why I support the denial of it because I don't want that behavior or action occurring in our community. Mr. That's Miller? what I was. She said. She said it. I. I just. I want to. Uh, again, we tried to deny this application. I don't know how many times over the years we recommended denial. We finally got OLCC's attention to make it go away. Now it's trying to come back. So I hope OLCC will listen and not uh, approve this application. It occurs to me that we have a neighboring fire district that also might be burdened by this application. Hopefully they can weigh in on the. <laughs> resource issues that it causes when there's shootings and stabbings and so forth in a parking lot in a community in East Salem. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Great. Okay. Now, Ryan, you're up. And we're going to consider approval of amendment number one to the Architecture and Engineering Standard Professional Services Agreement with Harper Hoffman. Peterson Regalis Incorporated to add $474,080.38 for a new contract total of $634,120.38 to provide preliminary engineering for the McKay Road Traffic Safety Improvement Project through December 31st, 2026. But if you could do it faster, that'd be great. <laughs> I think you will actually like our schedule. Oh, good. As you said, Ryan Cutler here to talk about our McKay Road Northeast Traffic Safety Improvement <coughs> Project and Amendment 1 to our uh, consultant agreement with Harper Hawk, Peterson, and Regalis. Project's located on McKay Road. Yeah. Pull that microphone close to you. Oh. We'll make sure it's on. I just know we're going to get text. Uh, there is a green button, uh, okay. so, or Great. green light, so can Great. you hear me better yeah, now? Yeah, just pull yeah. it tight. Okay. So the project's located on McKay Road, which is part of the Jurgen Ellen McKay Corridor. Um, it's actually located in two draws is where we're focusing, uh, where there's guardrail. Um, you can see the blue dash lines, those are uh, waterways. So if you've driven that roadway, you know where the road drops into those draws. That's where this project will focus. So the project scope, uh, when we get to construction, will include intermittent safety improvements. That includes adding a center uh, median. It's not going to be a full 12 foot median, not a turn lane. It's going to be uh, six to eight feet. Um, you can see this picture. I believe this is one of the highways uh, in the area. And so it'll look similar to that. Uh, there will be rumble strips added to the center. Um, and then there will be widening due to that added uh, width for that center median. The last thing is we'll construct associated drainage improvements, other, uh, if there's guardrail extensions that are needed, other improvements as needed in these areas. Mr. Chair? Sure. Yeah, please. Ryan, is there a reason we're not putting the concrete um, dividers in? So, originally the plan was to look at that as a future phase of this project. Uh, there's been concerns raised by the, uh, I guess, uh, ambulance uh, fire district uh, that if we put median barriers in there with the width that we have and the guardrail constraints, if there's an accident, they may have trouble getting emergency services into that location. Um, and so our operations group has also expressed concerns that to maintain guardrail, if you've only got, um, I think it's like 12 to 16 feet from medium barrier to guardrail, it doesn't allow you to route traffic around. 
Uh, we are building it so that's still an option in the future that we, our traffic group can evaluate and look at. Um, but the idea at this point would be to build the first phase of these improvements and continue looking at ways to improve upon them. So, so if I may follow. Please, yeah. Yeah, so it's the width of the right of way. Do we have enough right of way to, to go out further to, to uh, make that happen? Or do we not have the right of way yet? It, it's not the right of way so much as it is. These are at draws where there's creeks going through. So the roadway's been built up and there's culverts down right. below. And so off the side of the road, you've got a two or a three to one slope that slopes down into those waterways. Uh, to widen that road and to extend the guardrail out is uh, very expensive. Okay. Uh, because we don't have a way to easily widen that roadway. Uh, it also starts impacting the waterways, which triggers permits for, for working within wetlands or um, creeks. And so there's, there's more constraints when we do that. Okay. Is there a, a narrower way to have a barrier? Like, is, is, do the concrete, are the concrete ones wider because you have like some sort of fencing or something that would provide some sort of... I can talk to our traffic group. Um, I'm not familiar with the options. Uh, it's something that I want them to look at and evaluate and see if there's a way we could make it happen. If it's something you would like us to, to continue pursuing. Uh, the idea when we, we started this project and we were looking at it is uh, potentially Public Works could set barrier ourselves if we have a, a budget constraint. So we wanted to look at options of making sure we get this set up as well as we can to continue building on these improvements. So, okay. so I guess the, the improving the width of the median is helpful and then you put in rumble strips because it wakes me up if I start to cross it or whatever. But I, I was thinking of the fatalities we've had there and they've been head-ons, mm -hmm. right? I mean, most of them. So mm -hmm. anyways, I, I just wanted to bring that point up as if we go down this road, that's gonna maybe save somebody, but th that that concrete barrier like on 22 that you brought up commissioner last week that was missing mm -hmm. i finally saw the warning signs you know mm -hmm. as i was driving up the canyon those things really stop you from going across the road unless you flip and go over the top of it but that's that's a big one so anyways just wanted to hear that thank you mr chair yeah okay keep going so for this contract it's the engineering contract so what we've done so far is the alternatives analysis where we looked at the different alternatives, how wide of a median we could get in with the site constraints and optimizing the, the width so that we can get as much median in as possible without pushing out into that, that wetland area and some of the right of way takes that would slow the project down. Um, we've looked at it and I think we've worked with our consultant. We now have a plan to go forward with uh, plan specifications and estimates which would get us bid re ready construction documents. Uh, there's other items within this contract that are needed to get those plan specifications and estimates bid ready, but that is the ultimate goal of Amendment 1, is to get us to a project that we can bid and get a contractor on board for. Um, so the project budget and schedule. Uh, funding the original contract amount was $160,040. Amendment 1 would add $474,080 uh, for a new contract total of $634,120. Um, that is all ARPA funded, so it's 100% ARPA funded, no county, county match on this project. Um, and then our schedule includes completing uh, plan specifications and estimates by the end of 2024, having a contractor on board before the end of 2024, and beginning construction early in 2025. Um, we always have our end date for contracts be slightly further out than we expect to actually have the project end just in case we, we need a, a bit of extra time to wrap up plans. Um, we also have the option with this contract of adding in construction services, uh, which would be construction administration and assistance during construction from the engineer of record, uh, which would go through that construction season in 2025. And with that, uh, I'd open it up to any other questions. Mr. Bethel. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the questions Commissioner Cameron asked earlier. I'm not entirely clear on the fire district weighing in on access because that's not a conversation that was brought to the board at any point before today. So I'm interested further in the details of that discussion and if it's um, specifically 
we offered, we would barrier the entire median, or if there was a discussion about how far between gaps the barriers could exist, so that way emergency transportation can access that. I mean, obviously I-5 is a primary example of having barriers for a very significant distance, and there's, I don't know what they're called, access lanes for emergency services to cross to and from. Uh, I want to make sure that we're really putting our best foot forward on creating not just the notification of transitioning in lanes, but really saving people's lives. I mean, this year we've had a couple of deaths, and it, maybe it's not the entire corridor, but maybe it's the high traffic or the high impact sections of that corridor that are specifically barriered. Um, I know that we have some freed up ARPA dollars in Public Works because of a project that can't be moved forward in North Marion County, and this is in North, North Marion County, this project. I want to see if we could potentially bolster up the opportunity to create more safety there. So if you can go back to Carl and Lonnie or whoever and explore that and then get us the information on the discussion that occurred with emergency services, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, we will bring more information to you and uh, make sure we as we enter the plan specifications and estimates phase of this project, we still have a lot of opportunity to modify that plan and make sure we get what we want into this plan set that we're going to build. Okay. Uh, so we can continue bringing it to you um, and showing you where we're at and where the design is, is moving towards. Thank you. Well, and something that I just want to add, just to remind everybody, um, this is the, this problem became exacerbated because they didn't complete the Newburgh Dundee bypass. So a lot of, of what we're seeing is we're seeing traffic from people trying to get around the traffic in Yamhill County coming yeah. through there and we're seeing people frustrated at high speeds. And so while we're gonna do everything we can, and I agree with the commissioners, let's really make sure that if we're spending this money that we actually solve the problem. Um, this is not a Marion County created problem, but just because we didn't make it doesn't mean it's not our responsibility to fix it. So it's like a lot of things here. We, we still fix the things even if we didn't make the mess. Oh, good old ODOT. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, is there anything else before we. No, take thanks, a look? Ryan. Okay. Kevin, it's your motion. Do you want me to make it? No, I'll do it. Great. Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve uh, amendment number one to the Architecture and Engineering Standard Professional Service Agreement with Harper Huff Peterson Regilius. I appreciate that, Inc., to add. Four hundred and seventy-four thousand eighty dollars and thirty-eight pennies for a new contract total of six hundred thirty-four thousand one hundred and twenty and thirty-eight pennies uh, to provide preliminary engineering for McKay Road Traffic Safety Improvement Project through December thirty-first, twenty twenty-six. I second the motion. The motion is second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. All right, you're still here, Ryan. We're going to consider approval of amendment number two to the Architecture and Engineering Standard for Professional Services Agreement with Dow LLC to add $347,587.22 for new contract total of $1,021,063, sorry, $36.91 to provide architecture and engineering services for the Rambler Drive Northeast Little Pudding River Bridge Replacement Project through October 31st, 2025. Thank you again for the record, Ryan Crother, Public Works Capital Projects Manager. And as he said, I'm here to talk about our Rambler Drive project as well. Uh, so this contract amendment will focus on adding services for the construction phase and construction oversight for our Rambler uh, rehab project. Projects located on Rambler Drive. Oh. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I keep uh, switching back. Can you pull it close to you? Oh, pull it. There, you there we go. All right, so this project's located northeast of the city of Salem, uh, near Lake Labish. It's actually a bridge that crosses the historic Lake Labish. Um, so the existing structure is one of the largest uh, that Marion County owns. It's 1,575 feet long. It's a two-lane timber bridge. It was built in 1963, and that bottom photo uh, shows the extent and uh, how it crossed that historic lake bed. So our project scope uh, includes a lot of rehab uh, activities, including uh, replacing the rotting timber decking system and wearing surface, uh, timber pile caps, 
uh, compromised timber piles, we're going to replace those with steel. We're replacing most of these uh, rotting timber members with steel members so that they will hold up uh, and we won't have this issue in the future. Uh, we're identifying only members that actually are uh, compromised and that are rotting, so it's not a full replacement of the bridge, um, but it is going to prolong the life of the bridge uh, so that we can continue to use the facility. Uh, and then last, we're going to replace the bridge rail with a crash rated rail and uh, construct approach guardrails on each side of the bridge. So uh, our consultant is Dowell. This contract amendment would, like I said, add construction administration and construction inspection services. So project management, quality assurance, submittal reviews, uh, environmental and construction inspections. Uh, so we would have an inspector on site from this bridge designer at all times, um, and then they'd bring out their environmental inspector as needed for the federal process. Uh, we also would do a post-construction bridge load rating once the, the improvements are completed and as built drawings of exactly what was uh, constructed because as you go through construction things can change slightly uh, due to field conditions. Our schedule would include uh, bidding the project this fall and going to construction in 2020 or I guess winter um, and going to construction in 2024. So the, this is a federally funded project. Uh, and so we have the standard match uh, for county for, and federal funds. Uh, so our original budget for the contract was $673,449.69. Uh, amendment two adds $347,587.22. Of that, an estimated $35,697.21 would be paid with county funds. Um, for a new contract total of just over a million dollars. And with that, uh, do you have any questions? This is only for the engineering and the architecture? This isn't for the actual construction? That's correct. It's for the engineering uh, of the bridge and then the construction oversight, so having somebody on site during construction Holy and having the project manager involved. It's a ridiculous amount of money. Why is it so expensive? So uh, engineering uh, can typically run up to 25% of the construction budget. Don't have the number in front of me, but this project is approximately $5 million. Oh um, and when we look at the entire budget, it may be closer to six. I, I wish I had the, the budget in front of me so that I could give you the, the exact number. Yeah, that's uh, okay. But the, it falls into that range we'd expect uh, for that engineering services. And just for clarification, this went out for RFP, like standard process, and this was the lowest bid for the services? So for uh, A&E consultants, we actually select based on qualifications. And so we select the most qualified consultant. Uh, because it's a federal process project, we use ODOT standard billing rates that they've negotiated with these consultants, which uh, tend to be very competitive. Um, okay. And so we've, we've seen what they use outside of the ODOT process and what they use inside of the ODOT process. Uh, we negotiate, it. for this one, it's, they use what's called a escalated billing rate. Um, and that is, we have actual rates that they pay their staff. We escalate them based on their overhead and a profit margin. That profit margin's typically around 10%. And so they, they actually bill for staff hours. So if they don't use all the staff hours that are in this contract, we only pay for what they do use. So it's a time and materials not to exceed contract. Is this, it, okay, so it's like an up to amount? Exactly. Okay. It just seems like a lot of money. It's for a long one bridge. bridge I know, and it's the coolest one in Marion County. Now it's gonna go from wood to steel, but that's not the point. This is a lot of money. <laughs> but, you, but I just drove it, we just drove it. Were you with? I wasn't with you, but I did drive it to go to the, the uh, Oktoberfest. Okay, I just I just drove it last week with um, AJ. I think it was in my car, and, it, and you could see where it's breaking off on the side, and, and uh, it's like, oh, it's kind of like something at Disneyland. Uh, it was. It's. It, I'm Some surprised it was built in the '60s. It, it looks like it was built long, longer than that. Mm -hmm. And Ryan, this this money that we got, these federal funds, are specific for bridges, right? That's correct. They're actually specific for specific bridges. So they, it's through the local bridge program, and we submit applications uh, for bridges based on their uh, sufficiency rating and other factors. And uh, they have different categories. This fell into the bid, 
big, big bridge category yeah. uh, for an off-system bridge. And so they, they are able to fund bridges throughout the area, uh, depending on whether they're large or small, there's criteria that, that define that. And then on the national highway system or off the national highway system. Yeah. Okay. It's a quarter of a mile long, right? Isn't it? At least. I think it's, Would yeah, 1,500 feet. Yeah, so right around a quarter mile. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I move to approve amendment number two to the architecture and engineering standard professional service agreement with Dow LLC to add $347,587.22 for a new contract total of $1,021,036.91 to provide architecture and Is engineering right services for the Rambler Drive Northeast Little Pudding River Bridge Replacement Project through October 31st, 2025. I'll second the motion. We have a motion to second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Hey, aye. Before Ryan, before you go away, what's the um, time frame on the San Brentano Bridge? Oh my God! He, just he, sh he showed me. I, I he wanted you to see this picture of the Scotts Mills says Bridge that says Brentano the San Brentano <laughs> Bridge. So, what? Where is, is, is that? that Twenty six yeah. still for the Scotts Mills? That is currently where we're at. We are working through design, so we are in the design process. Uh, one of our engineers in house is actually designing that bridge. Uh, we currently are working through some historic issues. Uh, it was deemed to be a historic structure, so we're working with uh, the historic preservation office. Uh, to, to work out how to do that project. And so that's slowed us down just a little bit. Wow. Uh, but we're, we're going to start our right away phase here shortly. Okay. Just for the record, uh, the one thing Commissioner Brentano gifted me in our transition was a shovel to dig the first hole for that bridge, and it's in my office. So make sure that that thing gets over there and you take a picture for him. <laughs> he, feels very, he feels very strongly about it. I will make sure we do that. Oh my gosh. Is that right, sign really there? No. Oh. <laughs> I asked the exact same thing. How did I get there without our first Did you picture? want to see it, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. Who knew? All right. Photoshop, it's your best friend. Tell us not. Take it. I'll send it. Commander, come I'll on. I'll send it over to you guys. We're going to yeah. consider approval of the incoming funds in a governmental agreement with the Oregon Department of Corrections, the amount of $27,236,824 for expenses related to community correction supervision and services. Retroactive July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, I'm Commander Mike Hartford. I am Commander of the Community Corrections Division. Sorry. I know. I can kind of hear you, but yeah. they'll open the door and tell us otherwise. <laughs> uh, I'm here this morning to request approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the State of Oregon Department of Corrections. And here he comes. Oh, so he has have a green light. There. There you go. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to eat it. We got you all sorted out. Just don't smack it with your face. Right. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm here this morning to request approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the State of Oregon Department of Corrections and our 2023-2025 Community Corrections Biennial State Plan. This intergovernmental agreement is a contract with the State of Oregon to fund community corrections in Marion County for the approximately 2,800 adults on parole, probation, or post-prison supervision in our county. This funding is uh, for community corrections comes from the state through a legislatively approved budget. It's administered by the Department of Corrections, and each county is required to submit a two-year plan, which provides an overview on how you'll spend the money allocated. Generally speaking, funding for community corrections comes from a formula based on a rate per client per day on supervision. Each county receives an allocation or a portion of the statewide budget based on the percentage of clients on supervision in that county. So for the 2023-2025 biennium, Marion County's allocation for the legislatively approved budget is approximately 10.8% or $27.2 million in grant and aid for uh, the two years. This funding will provide the foundation for the core services that we provide the county, which are um, namely supervision, sanctions, and services for the people on, on parole or probation. Uh, the overall goal of this IGA and our state plan is to reduce criminal behavior, hold offenders accountable by enforcing orders and assisting offenders to change. So your approval of this plan will help continue to fund those key benchmarks. Commissioners, thank you again for your time this morning and your consideration of our plan, this IGA, and the board's continued support of community corrections. I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you, Commander. Are there any questions? No, they're here. Mr. No. 
Really? This okay. is a really big deal. I, I think I just want to thank you for your work. I know uh, you haven't come here that often. I'm not sure that many people in our community know you. Um, Yet. Welcome to the boardroom. <laughs> but I do think, I, I think it's important, uh, before I became a commissioner, I didn't realize how important community correction is, is to the safety of our community. Um, and what a vital role. I mean, I think most of us, when we think of public safety, we think there's police officers arresting people, there's jails, there's judges, there's courtrooms. Um, we don't think of all the work that community corrections does for folks who are on parole and probation and how important that work is to keeping our community safe. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Mr. Chair, Marion County has done um, awesome things. Uh, Commissioner Carlson started the reentry um, council, and uh, I remember when I was over at the state working together on trying to pass a lot of bills that, you know, uh, Senate Bill 456, which never passed, I don't think, or whatever the number was, 3494, uh, all those things have been implemented here in Marion County um, as a leader. And uh, reducing recidivism is what you just said, a public safety uh, improvement. Um, and it changes lives and gets people back together. Not everybody makes it through, but it's really an important, um, uh, you know, second chance for people. So, and you've got a breakfast coming up. Yep, on October 12th. Some of this. I think many people in this room will be there. So. We have a breakfast coming up. Yeah. yeah. You took it over this year. So, yeah. Thank you. You ready for motion? I'm ready for motion. All right. Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve incoming funds intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Department of Corrections in the amount of $27,236,824 for expenses related to community correction supervision and serv services retroactive to July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. I second the motion. We have a motion to second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Thanks, Commander. Thank you. Thank you, Commander. Okay. Now I'm going to open a public hearing to consider 10 ambulance service area franchise applications. Hi, Katrina. Hi, Matt. Come on down. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Katrina Griffith, the Deputy Director for Marion County Health and Human Services and also our Ambulance Service Area Administrator. Um, today we're here seeking approval for 10 Ambulance Service Area Providers application for a franchise agreement. Um, we recently hired Matt to help with this process, and I'm so thankful for his time and energy and his um, work with our partners to make this process go smoothly. So I'm going to turn it over to him to talk about the process and some of the work that has brought us here today. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Matt Newman, Marion County Health and Human Services. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit on the process of the applications. So each term is a five-year term. This one is expiring uh, December 31st, 2023. So that started our process of uh, taking a look at the ASA uh, application that we currently had and working very closely with the ASA committee and provider partners uh, and developing um, what is hopefully a more streamlined uh, version of the application, make sure we have all the information that's necessary, make it as easy as, as we can for them. Um, we started that process um, a couple of months ago um, and got all the applications in on time, uh, reviewed and uh, requested any additional uh, information that was needed. Um, and we wrapped that up and that brings us to this um, uh, meeting here where we're uh, looking for approval uh, for the 10 that are uh, currently providing. They have all uh, requested reapproval. Re um, one thing I wanted to, to make note uh, with the providers that they have, it, it's been a pleasure to work with them. Um, they have been providing in, in Marion County for quite some time now. So we look back at various contracts. Uh, in the past, and they work very well with one another. They, they're, they're familiar with each other's operations and uh, a lot of mutual aid and, and uh, assist in each other that way as well. Also appreciate working with the ASA committee and providers uh, on some of these uh, um, 
past documents that we haven't actually looked at for a little bit. So like the bylaws, we work closely with them on getting that um, approved and, and updated. Um, just like this process here. So we opened up to the committee and took suggestions on any information or anything to make sure that um, it is current. Uh, and the next uh, process will be, if this is approved today, will be the franchise agreement, which we will um, bring back in front of you at a later board session. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And I also want to echo what Katrina said. Um, we've really appreciated working with you. It's nice to have a steady hand at the tiller um, <laughs> during this process. So thanks for your, your, uh, your work and, and for being calm and, and keeping everybody together and moving along. Appreciate it. Um, this is a public hearing, and I see the chiefs here. Chief, do you want to? Do you have any comments? Uh, I have an uh, you gotta come to the microphone. You gotta come to the microphone. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Kyle McMahon, Fire Chief, Marion County Fire District Number One. Uh, pleasure to come today. I just like to echo what Matt and Contrita had have said. Um, just another great process of collaboration that we've had for probably about the last 15 years. Before that, it was pretty contentious, so it's nice to continue to move forward. I appreciate you know, that one point of contact now and the efficiency that we've gotten, the streamlined application that didn't take us a lot of resource time, and then the fact that we're sitting here in September, long before it expires, which provides stability for our citizens and gets things uh, kind of settled a long, long time. So, you know, and I think there's no real contentious stuff between the departments. So um, we've worked very long time to get all that done. So thank you to all everybody. Thank you. I was say, you, you have a, a role to play in how good the system is right now. So thank you for all your work over the years and getting us to where we are. Our pleasure. Commissioners, do you have any questions, comments? I just uh, no. I think you look at me. I'll keep my comments to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. thrilled that you're here, Chief McMahon, and I, I love Marion County Fire District Number One. <laughs> There's that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, <laughs> thank you, and I want to thank staff because this is and and Chief, but I, this is always a real. Uh, I think this is the second time this has happened since I've been here, and it's always one of those things that it creates a little bit of. Um, how do I want to say this? Conflict. Yes. But conflict can be positive as long as you uh, roll with it. So, anyways, thank you. Okay, is there anything else, Katrina? Would you like me to read off the 10 providers? Sure. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Um, ambulance Service Area 1, City of Salem Fire Department. Ambulance Service Area 2, Kaiser Fire District. Number 3, St. Paul Rural Fire Protection District. Number four, Marion County Fire District, number one. ASA five, Woodburn Ambulance Service. ASA six, Lions Rural Fire Protection District. Seven, Santia Memorial Hospital Ambulance. Eight, Turner Rural Fire Protection District. Nine, Jefferson Rural Fire Protection District. And last but not least, Polk County Fire District has a little area in South Salem. So we thank them for continuing their service here. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, is there anything else before I close this public hearing? Was anyone signed up? Only Chief McMahon. Don't run off. I have something for all of you after this is closed. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment before I close this hearing? I don't see anyone. Okay, then I will close the public hearing and I would take a motion. Um, on the that could have been the motion approving the ambulance service area franchise I move to approve an order approving 10 ambulance service area franchise applications as referenced in attachment a I'll second that motion we have a motion a second is there any further discussion seeing none all those in favor signify by saying aye 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 the motion passes thank you thank Appreciate you your work. thank you for being here thank you for your work Okay, is there anything else, commissioners, that does it for our agenda today? I'm good. Okay. Anything, Commissioner? Mm. You already expressed yourself via your I think I did. Your, <laughs> your <laughs> your photograph. Photograph. <laughs> my my Photoshop. <laughs> All right. All right, we are adjourned. <laughs>